Well, the, um, early in, at the beginning of the session, I, I requested uh, Ericsson Lopez to show up. Uh, sadly, uh, he must have some problems coming to, to Spain. He was uh, going to present uh, the Buo Sat from the Observatorio Astronomico de Quito, from Ecuador. Uh, he was one of the finalists in the selection process for the, the JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, for a launch next year. Uh, probably he found out that my group won, so. <laughs> no, seriously, he, uh, he sent all the information, but uh, we don't know why he didn't come. So we are 20 minutes ahead of schedule. So we will have a early coffee break, okay? So now we welcome Alexandro Zete. He works as an embedded software engineer in the SACCOM industry. He has been active in open source projects for more than 15 years. And he also is a member of the Copenhagen Suborbital, where he works with radio communications and video streaming. Um, he will talk us about using COD software and open source software for live video from space. So thank you. The floor is yours. OK, thanks. Uh, before I start, has anybody in this room heard about Copenhagen Suborbital? So, OK, that's good. Uh, for those of you who haven't, I can uh, tell that it's a crowdfunded uh, non-profit space program with one mission, and that is to launch a person into space on a suborbital flight in a homemade rocket and space capsule. So it sounds quite easy, right? <laughs> and uh, it all started with uh, two guys working in a, in a garage uh, back in 2008 and uh, has evolved since then. Today we are about 60 people working in our spare time building rockets and all the necessary infrastructure. Uh, this picture shows the timeline of our launches and tests. Not all of these vehicles have launched. Uh, some of them burned up in, uh, in, on a test stand. Uh, stuff like that happens. But uh, the early years until uh, 2014 were characterized by a lot of experiments with various uh, uh, engine technologies like solids and hybrids. And, uh, Beginning from uh, beginning with Nexo 1 in 2016, we started working more focused on uh, liquid engines with uh, bipropellants using uh, ethanol as fuel and liquid oxygen as oxidizer. And for those who are interested, it's because they are easy to obtain and easy to handle compared to the alternatives. So they are not the most efficient fuels or propellants, but they are easy to work with. Now we are based in Denmark, and Denmark is a very small country, densely populated, so launching rockets of uh, this size is not quite well accepted, it, it, not if you do it in your backyard. So what we uh, do is to sail out to the Baltic Sea to a range called uh, ESD-139. That's where the Navy goes uh, for exercises and shooting their guns and whatnot. So uh, that's an area where we can maintain range safety when we want to, want to launch uh, high up in uh, the atmosphere. This, of course, has uh, another issue because then we suddenly need a launch pad that can sail and float. So we just built one uh, in the early days. This is uh, Sputnik, our maritime uh, launch platform. It has its own engines, can sail on its own, uh, not fast. I think it's about three or four knots. Uh, it takes about 24 hours for it to sail from Copenhagen to uh, the island of Bornholm and out to the range. But it has served us very well, and uh, at least for these small and medium-sized rockets, when we get to the big rockets for, for the final mission, we will probably have to build a new one, a bigger one, but uh, shouldn't be a problem. In addition to uh, the launch platform, we also need uh, some support uh, vessels to carry out the mission. And uh, in the middle, you can see our uh, latest acquisition, uh, uh, our mission control ship. Uh, well, it's a boat, not a ship. But we use that for mission control and uh, uh, for uh, coordinating the sea operations. I should probably mention that we have a lot of uh, people or members who have a background in uh, not necessarily the Navy, but in, uh, in uh, the maritime environment. So they do a lot of sailing and know all this stuff. And uh, the small boats are the faster, faster boats. They are used for uh, 
taxing the crew to and from the launch pad while we carry out the, the launch campaign and also to maintain range, range safety. Just because it's a military shooting range and it has been announced that there is a missile launch happening that, that, that day, it doesn't prevent, for example, Polish fishermen from just sailing straight in and not caring about whatever is going on. So the only thing we can do is to sail to them and ask them kindly to leave because we are want to launch a rocket, and they usually do. <laughs> now, as I mentioned, it's a suborbital flight, so uh, this is a typical flight profile that we will experience or will have. It starts with a booster lifting uh, the payload up until it uh, burns out, runs out of fuel and cuts off. After that, the payload and the booster itself will follow uh, uh, ballistic trajectory, and at some point the parachutes deploy, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> we, had, we had a little difficulties over the years, but in 2008 we finally succeeded deploying the parachutes, and uh, so that was a great success. And this profile is for the Nexo 2 mission, which uh, took place this year, but it's typical for all the other missions as well, or that comes in the future. The difference will be that once we get a space capsule or something that uh, model is a space capsule, it will separate from the booster before it, they eat, come down each in with their own parachutes. Um, another problem with launching from sea is that, uh, uh, so we are a crowdfunded mission, we have a lot of fans, a lot of people who donate money and material and they would like to experience these launches because uh, they are spectacular, but they cannot come and watch the launches live, or they could, but we prefer not having too many people in the the area because things can go wrong, things can fall down at unexpected places. So uh, what we do instead, and this is a very important part of our mission, is to live stream everything we do or tests and uh, missions on uh, YouTube. We have developed a quite extensive uh, live streaming setup with a complete production crew, both in, uh, in uh, the, on the sea where we have mission control and uh, all the action going on, and back in the studio in Copenhagen. We have uh, speakers who uh, comment the launch, explain what things that, uh, what, what's happening, because usually we have uh, many hours of preparation and uh, delays and things that don't go according to plan, so they need to be there to entertain the live audience while it happens. Of course, uh, all this uh, requires uh, a lot of cameras to be able to uh, to cover it properly, and so we have practically cameras everywhere. It's like uh, Big Brother on the sea. On the sea. Um, and all the cameras are actually processed on board the mission control vessel. We have uh, some in-house developed software called Snowmix, uh, which is, uh, yeah, it's a quite extensive video mixer uh, uh, framework, basically. It uh, has been open sourced, and it's now maintained as its own project, hosted on SourceForge. And as uh, something new this year, beginning with Nexo 2, we have also have had uh, live streaming cameras on the rocket to uh, send uh, live video during the flight back to the ground station or to mission control and to the live audience. You can uh, see them as uh, feed number 10, 11, and 12, 12 being offline at the time the screenshot was taken, but uh, it worked very well. And so uh, the first camera, or camera one we had, was placed in the lower end of the rocket. Do I have a laser pointer here? Yeah. Here it, at the, the lower end of a, an external cable canal we had, it was looking down, providing a very nice uh, rear view. You can see here the rocket uh, just took off, and uh, you can see actually the launch pad uh, from, the abo from above. Camera two was uh, placed in the upper section. Uh, where we have had, had the parachute right there, looking out through a small hole, it was providing a nice horizon view. It's basically what an astronaut would have experienced if he was sitting in the rocket. And finally, camera three was uh, uh, pa placed inside the rocket together with the parachute, so it wasn't showing anything during the ascent, but as soon as the parachutes uh, or the nose cone was ejected and the parachutes deployed, we, we saw them with this camera. And, uh, all, uh, all these uh, cameras had a, was, were of great value to, for the mission control and the live audience to see because once the rocket, it's, it's not very big, so once the rocket is, has reached a few kilometers altitude, we can see them on uh, the cameras from ground. We don't have those good zoom cameras that uh, 
NASA and SpaceX have. We still need to find a sponsor for them. Uh, so it was very good to have a live view from the rocket itself. To, uh, to, to actually send the video down back to mission control, we, we uh, implemented a DVB-S2 transmitter. You already heard it mentioned uh, earlier and you will hear more about it tomorrow. It's uh, basically a, a standard, uh, basically a satellite TV standard and it uh, defines a one-way transmission of aud digital audio and video data over a satellite link. Uh, we don't have a satellite link, but we have a the transmission channel over the air is pretty much the same, so it's a very well suited standard for this purpose. And we had uh, three cameras. Uh, they were sending their video, encoded video, to a main computer, which uh, multiplexed them and uh, also ran a software-defined radio application as a modulator. Uh, it was, it's uh, GNU radio based. Uh, it's basically actually GNU radio today has a built-in uh, DVB-S2 transmitter blocks. So it was, uh, was very easy. And uh, then we use a transmitter device to convert the digital baseband to uh, RF signal. In our case, we used 1.3 gigahertz because it's a ham radio band and uh, uh, yeah, well, nobody really uses it uh, a lot, so plenty of room there. Um, here you can see uh, two of the cameras. Uh, as you may be able to recognize, they are Raspberry Pi Zeros uh, with their corresponding camera modules. Um, they, they work very well for uh, this purpose. They just capture the video, use the built-in hardware encoder to encode it into something like uh, four megabits per second, just below four megabits per second, and they send it up to the main computer. Uh, the main computer, this is a, our transmitter, the flight unit, before we close the lid on it. On the left side, uh, you can see that the main computer, which is an up board, it has an Intel processor in it, so it has plenty of uh, computing power for running uh, the software-defined radio transmitter. In the middle, we have the, uh, the transmitter device, which you can recognize as a Hacker F1. It's, uh, today we may not cho choose a Hacker F for this purpose, but this was, uh, the design was locked about three years ago, so back then it was the best choice and it was very easy to work with. And finally, the power amplifier is based on a ham radio kit. So again, it's not the electronics that cost a lot of money, but uh, mostly integrating it and testing it, of course, before flight. And I'm happy to say that it worked very well. Uh, some of you may have seen this uh, video that was posted on YouTube already the day after the launch. It showed the three uh, the video from the three cameras uh, stitched together uh, and synchronized. Uh, we had uh, very good video coverage uh, from liftoff uh, until splashdown uh, with occasional dropouts because although we have active guidance on the rocket, uh, it's still uh, rolls uh, that's they're very difficult to control without uh, roll uh, thrusters and we don't have them on these small rockets. So we had some uh, occasional dropouts, but otherwise quite solid uh, downlink all the way. And we also locked some uh, data during the flight, uh, the bit error rate and the received packet rate. The blue curve on this graph showed the uh, 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 the altitude of the rocket during the flight, it's uh, useful to see because uh, you can see around the apogee, the rocket starts to turn over and then we uh, drop off a little. Uh, the big uh, drop in packet rate, that's when the, the parachute is deployed. That gives a lot of vibrations and uh, basically an explosion happens the same place where we have the transmitter to eject the nose cone. But otherwise quite solid uh, packet rate uh, all the way down. So we were very happy with the results and uh, uh, the good thing about uh, DVB-S2 as a, as a basis for design is that with, within the envelope we have with 10 megahertz bandwidth and uh, about 50 watts of DC power, we think we can scale up to 50 megabits per second over a more than 100 kilometers range, so it's quite good. And uh, I think uh, that's all I have for now. Or Uh, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit more on the uh, type of 
a computer that you use for the transmission system and how is it connected to each of the Raspberry Pis with the cameras? Yes, uh, so the, the main computer is, uh, it's called an Upboard, that's the brand and uh, that was uh, the original uh, design they made. It has an Intel Atom processor, I think quad core, you can get them in various shapes and sizes. It has uh, four USB ports. We used three of them to connect to the Raspberry Pi Zeros but they were configured to use USB network protocol. So the USB connection functioned as an Ethernet connection. In Linux, it's quite easy. Uh, I forgot to mention, but the, the source code and the configuration files are on GitHub, so I can uh, tell you in more details, but it's USB net as a protocol, or what it's called, is very standard on Linux. So, Thank you. Yeah. More questions? Rockets? So I, I guess I watched a video last year about that new patch antenna and it looked a, a very interesting design, how mm. it wraps around the, the rocket. Um, I'm kind of curious how far you were back receiving the signal, um, you know, and so <coughs> over what kind of angle yeah. you had to exercise that array. Yeah, so uh, um, the, uh, the range to the rocket didn't exceed uh, seven or eight kilometers. It, uh, the problem with flying so straight is that you <laughs> fly straight, but we uh, also tested the new antenna design, uh, which is this uh, pad you see on the bottom. Uh, originally, we used these uh, monopoles that you see on the top, these black horns, but they are very impractical because uh, the people who have to handle the rocket, they really hate them. Uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, we hate them because they have a lousy radiation pattern. That's what you can see on that. They radiate up and down. The patch array we have has a, is more isotropic. So that's here on the right uh, side. And uh, this was simulated, but I think we pretty much uh, had because, yeah, we had very few dropouts uh, along the way. That was unfortunately done with a very expensive and proprietary software. So, uh, uh, and. Okay, actually I have a couple of questions. Now that you are talking about antennas and so on, uh, and also about SDR. The first one, uh, in your explanation, you have mentioned that maybe you have to start again with the design. You wouldn't use the, the hacker ref, you, you mm. would use something else. So I yep. would like to understand then why, mm. what is behind this, that sentence, no? So why mm. you prefer something else and, and which would be your candidate? This is the, the first question. And the other is that, uh, <coughs> okay. Yeah, let's, otherwise I, I get yeah. old and forget, yeah. Uh, so the HackRF is a great device because it's, uh, it was designed by a software guy or software engineer background and he really made it easy to use. I mean, that has the cleanest programming interface I have ever seen. But it's not so good on the RF side uh, and also it has limited dynamic range to eight bit, uh, uh, today we have uh, better options, I think, but for this flight it was sufficient. It gave us sufficient dy dynamic range together with the receiver we used. But so today I would probably look into, well, Lime SDR or uh, the new Blade RF that came out, uh, mm -hmm. or whatever we can get sponsored actually. It's, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. <laughs> okay, but, uh, and the second question is that in, uh, yeah, now in the transmitter subsystem and so on, uh, or more, more people every time is using SDRs, no? Mm -hmm. seen. But the, the SDRs and the, uh, are nice because they're simple, it's, uh, it's everything on software, it's very fast. But at the same time, uh, in terms of, uh, of RF, are not as good. I mean, in terms, you are, you are polluting, maybe, you are transmitting in frequencies that you are not expecting to transmit. Mm. So, and then uh, yeah. you are maybe bothering other services uh, or mm. even science, yeah. no? like uh, radio telescopes or things like that. Yeah. So, you take care of uh, all these things in order to have a clean uh, transmission signal in, mm. in your designs? Yeah, we, uh, we did. We checked uh, the output of the spectrum analyzer. Uh, the good thing is that once you get up, go high up in frequency above one gigahertz, then uh, uh, your matching circuits uh, after the transmitter will actually start acting as filters. So even though uh, uh, the HackRF may transmit uh, something on uh, six gigahertz or five gigahertz, it doesn't really get through. 
because uh, the input and the output of the power amplifier are really specifically uh, tuned to the specific frequency. Um, we, saw, we saw a little uh, extra uh, coming, uh, I think it was 20 megahertz away. It was actually still within our frequency band, so <laughs> it wasn't a problem. Uh, clearly, we, it's a, an advantage for us to be able to use ham radio frequencies that are not used a lot. And second, it was a very short duration <coughs> flight and out in the middle of nowhere. So, uh, mm -hmm. but we didn't have uh, we didn't have any problems with uh, spurious emissions. So. Okay. No, I just mentioned that because there are satellites that mm. the, the the payload is a uh, radiometers. Mm. And for instance, there are some ones that are measuring about one gigahertz. And mm. if you uh, uh, transmit an spurious signal, no, an harmonic, yeah. uh, uh. and those frequencies you are uh, polluting the, uh, you could pollute the, uh, the measurement. Yeah, I know uh, this 1.3 gigahertz band is going to be a fight with the GPS uh, thing because there's, I think, there's, I don't know if it's GPS uplink or downlink or something. Uh, there was, no, I know I'm they had to turn a transmitter off in Germany because that was close to a Galileo yeah. station. Yeah. And also for, for astronomical yeah. applications, there is the 1.4 gigahertz, that is the ah. hydrogen band. That hmm. We don't know which frequencies we are going to use in the long run, but uh, we just move up as it gets more and more crowded. I mean, we can work up to 24 gigahertz, I think. Uh, mm. yeah. Okay. Mm. More questions or feedback? So you mentioned, if I recall cor uh, correctly, that your rocket runs on ethanol and liquid oxygen. Mm. So ethanol sounds easy. Where can I get liquid oxygen? Well, uh, the, we get it from uh, uh, well, those who deliver it, uh, gases and things like that. It's, we, we get this. And, and uh, um, a more serious question. So um, when you, I guess when you buy it and you put it into a rocket, mm. um, I guess it would evaporate or something? Like how long? Yeah, How do you need to handle that, like the timing and everything? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's one of the difficult uh, things to handle. Uh, I have to make a disclaimer, I'm really not a, one of these uh, uh, engine guys, but uh, it's, it's a big pain in particular when uh, it's out in the sea and the sun is heating it, uh, it's, it's, it has to go quickly. So once we have loaded and uh, pressurized the, the LOX uh, system, we just have to launch within five minutes, otherwise it's a scrum. <laughs> And we have a limited amount of locks uh, with us. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's delivered in a big, uh, I don't know what it's called, it's a pressurized uh, container. So, yeah. So, you lo load it onto the rocket like just before launch, yeah. not like a day before. Yeah. And uh, if you watch the video or the pictures, uh, better to watch the pictures on uh, Flickr, you can see that uh, as the rocket takes off, next to you, as it takes off, something falls off. That's the external insulation cover, which we have on it normally just before, uh, until just before launch. But we chose to leave it on this time because it was so hot that we were afraid that it will uh, boil uh, so quickly that we, we just wouldn't launch. So we just let it on and let it fall off uh, during flight. <laughs> People were worried that, oh, it's stuff falling off the rocket, but uh, <laughs> well, it was on purpose. Thanks. Are you using a pressurized uh, system for uh, the liquid oxygen and the ethanol, or is it with electric pumps? Oh, no, not, uh, you, I mean, I assume you mean turbo pumps. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was discussed, but I think that's a very difficult technology to master. Uh, so they just pressurize, pressurize yeah. canisters? Uh, Nexo 1 uh, was uh, pressurized and left there. Nexo 2 had a pressure regulation system to keep a constant pressure, and that worked uh, almost perfectly as well. I think that was one of the valves that there that malfunctioned, and that's why we didn't reach the target altitude of 16 kilometers. But it had a, a, a direct pressure regulation hmm? with the helium in, a, I think, 250 bars or something like that. OK, one or two more questions. You had already enough. <laughs> OK, then. Uh, Okay, so sure. thank you, Alex, thank you. again. Uh, 
Okay, so I'm going to uh, the, okay, the coffee I, break I is now. The, no. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, I just. Uh, so I got uh, five people for the pitch. Uh, there's still rooms up for some people. So that will be after the coffee break. Uh, so that for now, that's two minutes per people, per person. And that's uh, preferably no slides because that's, that goes faster, but you can have a slide. Uh, so if you're still uh, here and you have an idea or you're looking for help for a project or you're looking for, looking for people, looking for some people doing your marketing or whatever, uh, you can come to me and I will add you on the pitch list. But else I think it's Yeah, it's the, it's the time of the day again where you have uh, coffee. And uh, since we are in Spain, it's, everything is a bit late. So they have the coffee what? break at five, uh, and we have uh, 20 minutes to half an hour break. We will call you back in for the pitch session and then the work groups. Um, and those who do a pitch, please uh, see Red One. And also those who want to do a work group, please stay here for a moment so we can coordinate. And everyone else, rush to the coffee. <laughs>